G'day all, welcome to another video. Uh, we're going to be talking about X64 caches today for a few videos. Um, these videos are going to be about performance programming in x86 and x64 assembly language mostly, but um, I think the information is useful no matter what language you program in. So we're going to be using C++ uh, mostly for today, but eventually we will get into assembly. It'll just um, take a few videos. Uh, I think this information is going to be helpful to people that program in higher level languages too, but I don't know. So it's all good. Okay, so the topics for today. First of all, I'm going to go through what a cache is. Then we're going to talk about the basic architecture of a computer. Then a bit of basic cache terminology. Uh, then we'll have a look at x64 caches in particular. And then a bit of a demonstration of something that I found really counterintuitive when I first uh, saw it. Uh, it's really weird. It's really weird. So we'll have a look at a demonstration at the end in C++. Okay, so what is a cache, first of all? Uh, a cache is a small area of on-chip memory on the CPU itself. And it's used whenever we make a request to or from system memory, so RAM. Uh, what happens when you request a variable from RAM? Uh, the CPU first checks to see if the data is actually in its cache. And if the data is in the cache, then the CPU will just use that version uh, because reading and writing to cache is much faster. Uh, if the data is not in cache, then it'll go all the way to DRAM. It'll bring the data into the CPU from memory and it'll store it in cache. And then next time when you want the same data, it can just use the cached version. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we're talking about. Um, just a small area of on-chip memory that's used to speed up read and write accesses and avoid reading from system memory. Okay, so a little bit about computer architecture. Um, this will start to give us an idea of why caches are so fast. So the f CPU up here has the cache on chip. It's actually part of the silicon. And the CPU is connected to the memory controller, which is also connected to the PCIe or PCI Express, which is your graphics card. And it's also connected to system memory uh, over here. So whenever you need to get a variable, if it's not in cache, then you can see that it's, there's a long way to go. I mean, just distance-wise, in the wires of the computer, there's a long way to go. Um, your request has to go through the memory controller, off to system RAM. The RAM chips have to say, yep, here's the data, mate. They send it back to the memory controller and send it back to the CPU. So it takes a long time. That all takes a very, very long time. And down here, we have even slower types of memory. Your USB, your keyboard and mouse, your IDE drives, SATA drives, parallel ports, they're all really, really slow. Because not only have they got to go through the North Bridge, the memory controller, but they've also got to go through the I.O. controller or the South Bridge. OK, but that's not the only reason why caches are fast. Another reason why caches are fast is because they are fundamentally a different mechanism of storing information. So DRAM, which is system memory. I don't know why I've got plus plus here. <laughs> system memory. Plus plus. Yeah, I don't know. DRAM is constructed from a few transistors, maybe a couple of transistors, and a capacitor. And the capacitor fills up with charge and empties its charge. Whenever the capacitor is full, uh, it's read as a 1. And whenever the capacitor is empty, it's read as a 0. But uh, when you want to read from a DRAM cell, the capacitor has to empty its charge. And that takes time. So SRAM works differently. SRAM, I think it's, I think it's 6. Uh, I think it's 6 transistors in a fascinating configuration. <laughs> Uh, but the six transistors are connected together such that if you want to read a 1 or a 0, the SRAM cell has it immediately. It doesn't have to empty any capacitors or anything like that. You can just read and write the value immediately. SRAM has like six transistors per bit. So it's much more expensive than DRAM, which is just a couple of transistors and a capacitor. Yeah, so caches use SRAM, which is really, really fast but expensive. And main memory is um, slower. DRAM, but it's less expensive. Okay, a little bit of terminology. We talk about cache hits. A cache hit is if we request data from RAM and the CPU checks its cache and the data is already in cache. That's what we want. This is what we want. We want cache hits. A cache miss is what we don't want. Um, a cache miss is when we request a variable from RAM, the CPU checks its cache, and it finds out that the variable is not cached. And it has to go all the way to RAM and get the variable from there. A data cache is cache that's used for storing data or your variables, your arrays, and all of that sort of stuff. 
An instruction cache is a cache that's used for storing executable instructions. Um, a unified cache is a cache that can be used for instructions and or data. Uh, a clock cycle is the smallest time measurement available to the CPU. So if you've got if you've got a CPU that runs at one gigahertz, then there's a clock in the CPU that's ticking by one billion times a second. And there is no smaller amount of time that exists for the CPU. That's the smallest possible amount of time for the CPU. So if you've got a three gigahertz CPU, the clock ticks by at three billion times per second. Yeah, nice and easy. But latency is often measured in clock cycles. The latency of an activity for the CPU is the number of clock cycles that it takes to perform that activity. Yeah, so really what we want to do when we're performance programming is we want to reduce the number of clock cycles that our code takes to run. That's what we're trying to do. All right, a little bit about x86 and x64 caches in particular. Um, they're called L1, L2, and L3. The L stands for level, and the smaller is better. So L1 is the smallest but the fastest cache. Many x86, x64 CPUs have data and instruction L1s separately. And I want to also mention that if you've got a multi-core CPU, the L1s are per core. So each core has its own L1. Um, they've also got their own L2. Uh, L2 is medium sized and medium speed. And L3, which is usually the largest uh, cache in an x64 machine, L3 is the largest cache, but it's also the slowest. And another thing about L3 is that it's shared amongst the cores. So you only get one L3, whereas if you've got a quad core, you'll get four L1s. Or eight, actually, because you get instruction and data. And you also get four L2s. Okay, so a lot of budget CPUs don't actually have an L3. They stop at L2, but yeah. A lot of this stuff is hardware specific, and um, there's ways to figure out exactly what sort of cache your CPU has, and we might look at that in a future video, but yeah, L1, L2, and L3. Okay, so here's some real cache numbers from hardware that's available at the moment. We've got Intel i7-6950X. This is a crazy CPU, crazy price too. A uh, huge instruction cache, 320 kilobytes. Huge data cache, 320 kilobytes. Uh, the L2 is 2.5 meg, and the L3 is 20 megs. Something interesting that you'll notice here is just how small caches are. So if you think about the system RAM of a computer, it could easily be 8 gigabytes uh, of DRAM in your system memory. The cache is 320 kilobytes on a $2,000 CPU. So caches are tiny. They're just tiny, tiny things. Um, this is interesting too. So, uh, so a few months ago, probably getting onto a year now, um, AMD started releasing Ryzen's, these Ryzen chips. And they're really taking a market share out of Intel for the first time in, I think, a really long time. I mean, um, Intel has really dominated the market for a really long time. But these Ryzen chips are performing really, really well. And you often hear people saying that it's because of the core count. And, and they certainly do have a high core count. But I think it's more than that. I think you can also look at these caches because for the price, these caches are enormous. Uh, this is a Ryzen 7 um, 1800X, it's not a cheap chip by any chance. Um, it's cheaper than the i7 here though. Uh, this L1 instruction cache, 512K, that's huge. Um, data cache, again, 256K is a huge uh, L1 data cache. So I think one of the reasons why these Ryzen chips are doing so well is not only their core count, but also they've got the cache to back these cores up. Amazing. It'll be interesting to see what happens if you're uh, watching this in the future. You probably know how this all turns out. I've yeah, I'd like to see Intel's response to this. They've got um, Coffee Lake coming out soon. We'll see what they do with Coffee Lake. Now, uh, one of the interesting things that Intel used to do, this was back in the Broadwell days. So going back maybe three or four generations, they had these Broadwell chips. And the, the Broadwell chips had um, an L4 cache, which was quite cool. It wasn't, um, it wasn't SRAM, though. It was uh, EDRAM, what they called EDRAM. Uh, it was really just embedded dynamic RAM. So it was that capacitor RAM. Yeah, so it was it was slower than SRAM caches, yeah, L1, L2, and L3, but uh, it was on chip, so it was faster than going out to memory. They stopped doing it after Broadwell, so I think a lot of people were confused and a bit annoyed that they stopped doing it, because apparently this L4 added a lot to their gaming experience. Um, I don't really game a lot, but yeah, a lot of gamers were annoyed that they reduced this, uh, or got rid of this L4, so we'll see what they do in the future in response to Ryzen, which should be interesting. Intel, what do you got? Uh, another few chips here, the um, 
Uh, Ryzen 5 just here. Even even the Ryzen 5 has a, has a pretty decent sized cache. Yeah, pretty decent cache. They're all good chips. They're all good chips. Uh, and the prices are in AUD from Umart as of yesterday. Um, all right, here's a bit of a memory speed comparison. So this table shows some timings of latency. Register access is about one clock cycle. You can't really access any memory faster than registers. Registers are even faster than cache. Uh, L1 cache hit is going to cost about three clock cycles. L2 cache hits about 15 clock cycles. L3 cache is about 60 clock cycles. If we miss all of the caches, then we've got to go all the way to main memory. We'll talk about how data gets stored in the L1, then L2, then L3 at a different point. But if we miss all of these caches, if the data is not in the cache that we want, we've got to go all the way to main memory, and that's going to cost something like 150 upwards cycles. So main memory, very, very slow. And then hard drives. If we ever got to get something from the hard drive, well, we might as well just go to sleep for a million years. Yeah, so that'll give you a bit of an idea there of the speeds of memory. And now we're going to talk about matrix multiplication. So I wanted to show an example of something that I found really counterintuitive. And we'll jump over to C++ and we'll um, see you there. Oh, the coffee's empty. Okay, g'day. We're back here in uh, Visual Studio for a bit of a demonstration. This is weird. This is so, so weird. Um, just a little matrix product demonstration. So this is the front end just here. We set up two matrices of a thousand by a thousand each called A and B. And what we're going to do is multiply them and store the product in the matrix C. Um, it's all really testy and demo-y and um, there's no checks or anything for if the matrices are square or even the same size. So yeah, it's just a demo. Now you'd have to be more careful about that sort of thing if you were coding this for real. But the A and B matrices are just set up with random values just here. And then we run through 10 times multiplying the A and B and storing that product in C. This is really the crux of what we're talking about today, this mull operation just here. And we time that each time using the clock method from C time. And then just print out some results here at the end. So basically, um, we're just using the n cubed nested for loop version of the matrix product. If you want to have a look uh, about matrix products on uh, Wikipedia, if you're not familiar with them, that's probably a good idea. But anyway, let's just run this and we'll see how quickly it goes or how slowly as the case may be. Um, I already know how long it takes. I'm not going to lie. It takes a very long time. Yeah, it's boring. So let's not watch it. Let's actually come over here to the matrix class and have a bit of a talk about that. Uh, we'll get back to that time in a minute. It's doing that in the background. Um, so the matrix class is just a bunch of doubles, really, um, with a dimension just there. Yeah, so we set up dimension by dimension doubles and um, yeah, just fill it up with random values. Uh, delete just gets rid of that data array. Uh, set lets you set an element. Get lets you get an element. Mov just moves one matrix to another. And mul is really what we're concerned with here. How do we perform the product? You want to be able to perform matrix product uh, really, really quickly. So that's really what we're talking about. Okay, here's the set just here, the set method, pretty boring. Here's the get method just here. Uh, the mov method just copies the data from one matrix to another. But the mul method, so what we're doing here in the mul method is literally the three nested for loops. We count through the rows in one for loop, the columns in another for loop, and for each of those, we're computing the dot product. So this is literally just textbook uh, naive matrix multiplication. But let's have a bit of a look at these times. So here we go. Look at this. 14.158 uh, seconds, 13.807 seconds. So it's taken a long time, um, a long time to, to compute those products. So let's just hit stop. So we've got a bit of an idea there. If I type like 14. Point, what did we say? 809 or something like that. I'll punch that into my calculator for later use. But now the trick. So this, I, I think this is just bizarre. This is just bizarre. But it's very, very cool. So what we're going to do is actually define this matrix twice. Um, we're going to define it in RAM twice, in row major form and in column major form. So it's going to take up twice the RAM, but well, let's just see what happens. Okay, I'll call that data col. I'll call this one data row. Okay, so data col is going to be storing it in a convenient way to read the columns when they're incrementing. Data row is going to be uh, in a convenient way to read them when the data is being read in contiguous rows. <laughs> I hope that makes a bit of sense, but we're basically just doubling our RAM footprint. What is this going to do to our performance? 
Um, all right, in delete, we better delete both of them. So delete row and delete col. We have to make a few changes. I'm sure I'm going to make a mistake. I actually tried to record this a minute ago, but uh, it didn't work out. It did not work out. So that's about all the changes we have to make there. Let's come over here to the matrix.cpp file. Okay, when we set, we want to set twice. You want to set once in whoops, column major form. And you want to set once in row major form. So this row major form just here is actually the column major form, but it's rotated 90 degrees. Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're storing the matrix like this, and then beside it somewhere in RAM, we're storing it on its side as well. It seems crazy. It seems crazy, but I'll tell you what, it's not. <laughs> um, col. Actually, we're going to write two of these get methods. So we'll just leave that for the time being and we'll come down to mov. Okay, we've got a mov twice as much data as well. So um, all of these operations will be much slower now because we're using twice as much RAM. So the, the, the mov and the set and get, they're going to be twice as slow or half the speed as the other. Um, okay, but for get, um, we're going to make two of these. So one of them's going to read the data in the column major form, and the other one's going to read the data in the row major form. So we're now going to have two get methods. Let's call it um, get col for get column major and get row for get row major. So that's column major just there. And row major is going to be... Um, it's it's not it's not super important all of all of this fiddly stuff is not super important it's not really the point of the demo the point of the demo is is the is the ending so if you're not really following that's you know it's all good uh, but data call uh, this is going to be data row okay and they're not defined so we'll put them in our header let's say get call and get row and we'll save that. Okay, now down here in our matrix product, instead of just reading the same, um, which was column major, we're going to do a column major read for this one, but this one's going to be a row major read. Okay, so what have we done here? Well, we've um, probably got errors is probably what we've done. Yeah, there we go. We've got... <laughs> We've got errors. Get is not a member of matrix. Ah, oh, good stuff. In the main method, yeah, mains wind and all right. How do you like um is that good? Uh normally when you read in row major form, it means that the row parameter comes first. Um I didn't bother to change the orders around there. I just changed the order that I used them in the method, which is probably a bit confusing and I might have done it a different way, but let's give it a run and see what happens. Oh, look at that. Um, okay, so that's about 2.481 seconds, about two and a half seconds. Let me just punch that into the calculator. This is about six times faster than it was a second ago. So we've taken up twice as much RAM, and in theory, that would mean that we're really looking at a much slower algorithm, but the timing says it all. Um, we're not actually performing anywhere near as many RAM reads. Um, this second version, although it takes twice as much RAM, is actually using the cache much, much better. And that's where the performance is coming from. That's where it's coming from. I hope that was interesting. Um, have a bit of a think about why that might have happened, and uh, we'll talk again more about caches in the future, get into a bit more of the, a bit more of the details. <laughs> It's interesting stuff, and I tell you what, like this is, that's a good, that's a good trick right there. That's, I found that fascinating. That's a good trick. Have a good one.